less expected of you and more appreciated of you. Wow. Well, just, just imagine just for a second that, that that relationship you're thinking of, those people in that relationship, they, man, they just appreciate you. And you just walked in this space of complete freedom, no expectation. Now you can just be yourself. You could, you could have, you could just reveal all the mess that you are, all those inner wranglings of your mind and your heart. It just, it wouldn't matter because you knew that you were with people that would just not expect you to be anything like that. Imagine that being in our relationships. Well, to do the phrase expect less and appreciate more, it kind of sets you up to be the one that provides that environment for the ones you love. So God is agitating by His power and His Spirit deep within our hearts to love one another as we have been. Loved. And so this morning, can I just encourage us to have a look at Jesus? Here we see in verse 1, in the year that King Isaiah died, verse 1 of chapter 6, that there was a view the Lord presented to Isaiah. Isaiah says that I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high Today God is saying, see me high and lifted up. My throne where I am, I am holy. We've been talking about holiness. We've been talking about us being holy. We've been looking through Colossians 3 and verse 12 where it says, you are holy. Well, we are made in the image and likeness of holy. High and lifted up. High and lifted up. See God. See Jesus this morning. High and lifted up that He is holy. He is not just without sin. He's unrivaled. He's unmatched. He's awesome. He's pure. He's morally perfect. He's absolutely and completely unique. But He's, he's decided that He would share some of His unique characteristics, His uniqueness, and create us as unique as well. And, and I can just see these angels here, these seraphim that are, that are positioned, and Isaiah in this, this space where there's angels that are communicating their thoughts to all of heaven. And they're saying, Holy! I'll do it with the microphone, you ready? <laughs> Holy! Yeah. Did you just, the doors just shook there, sure. Well, that's what happened in heaven in this moment that the Lord decided that Isaiah was going to see him high and lifted. That he was going to see him, that Isaiah was going to be able to partake of this holy moment. Where there was Isaiah and these angels viewing the uniqueness and the absolute awesomeness of God. And I guarantee you in the first part of their thoughts it was not, he didn't sin today. And when you and I think about holy and being holy, I know that's pretty high up in our level of thinking, right? Well, I didn't sin today. No, I didn't, because I thought I didn't sin, but I did this pride. Oh, it's God, I just hit it! Holy. He's absolutely unique. He is set apart and he is set on high. And so as the angels were viewing, and Isaiah got this picture. He got to see. He is set on high. Awesomeness and purpose to be it and to reveal it. Did you know that when the Lord calls you holy, He's calling you awesome and having a purpose? He is declaring to you you are absolutely and completely unique. And not just from the form of me drawing you and pulling me from your secret, sacred place, your mother's womb where you were formed and knitted together, but you now as followers of Jesus Christ are completely 
restored, created anew, and you are awesome when you were born, but now there's a whole different kind of awesome. Because now awesomeness has collided with purpose. You can be holy as a human, not just in behavior, but in design. Most of us just think of our holiness connected to our behavior. I can guarantee you that evening, I think it was an evening, I'm going to say it was an evening, I think it was a year, we know it was a year, that um, there's evenings and years. When, when, when Isaiah was caught up and he saw, he, he wasn't just thinking God's behaving good. Now think about these angels. They, they had access to this throne that, that, that Isaiah had in a moment, for a moment. These guys, these guys, they're stood around it. They're, they're in position around it. And these guys, these guys are crying holy where the doorposts of heaven are shaken because again they've seen another awesome, unique attribute, characteristic of God. These guys, these guys have been given a voice box that shakes heaven. Because God is revealing himself continually to them to sing out of oh, you see that thing. I didn't know that before. You are holy by design, by purpose, and by awesomeness. The new creature you are isn't just uniquely awesome as a created human being, but you now have your sin forgiven. You're a new creature that now can also reflect You see, holy is not just about behavior and everyone seeing us as, well, you are religious, you follow Jesus, you go to church, and so there's a certain expectation on how you should behave. God has an expectation on His attributes being revealed through His Holy Spirit. We've been talking about those attributes in Colossians. Kindness, mercy, and, and how... Those actions don't make us holy. Those actions come from holy. So what God was doing and Jesus was doing here on the throne came from holy. They didn't make him holy. They arrived, they were seen, they were witnessed because holy, unique, awesome was present. And can I say to you this morning, because you are present, holy is here. Because you have placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. You are a new creature if you follow him. And if this morning, if you haven't, there's going to be time and opportunity for you to understand personally what it is to be called holy, not according to your actions. But according to your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Awesomeness meets purpose, which results in God. So holy is not what we achieve or accomplish, but what we are. Holy is what He calls us. Then because of His calling, we respond. Because of who we are, there's a response of tender mercies and kindness because we are holy, elect, and beloved. Our holiness is possible as we are made in the image of See the Lord high and lifted up this morning and your holiness is possible because of your image, your new creature, your oneness with a holy God. Romans 1, 17 talks about us being called saints and, and if you go through some of the epistles, those are the books of the New Testament outside of the Gospels and the book of Acts, you'll find that Paul refers to his readers, which happens to be you and me this morning. Turn with me to Romans 1. Let me read you something that God thinks about you. Romans 1, verse 7. Who's ready? Who's ready? I'm ready. Well, we're not in Rome, but hallelujah. 
to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Called to be saints. 2 Corinthians 1 says something very similar. Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 says the same. And so does Colossians 1.2. And it's interesting, we've been studying out of Colossians 3. And Colossians 1 is an earlier part of the letter to the Colossians church. So when Paul is saying in Colossians 3 verse 12, holy, you are holy, he is backing it up. He is sitting it on the top that he's called us saints. Now, I know saint, we, there's saints that we as humans have declared as saints. And then there's saints that the Father has declared as saints. Don't mistake the two. You are a saint. Now, because you're a saint, that means you are set apart, you're consecrated, you're holy, you are pure, you are blameless. But listen to this, get this, you get that, you go, I can't be blameless. Oh, I know I'm pure because of Jesus, and he's perfect, and I'm not perfect. But because he's perfect, and I'm not perfect, therefore I'm perfect. Because God looks at him, and God looks at me. And you know all that. You wrestle that out all the time. I know you do this. I have conversations with you, and I have had conversations with you. After I've had conversations with me, well, I've been figuring all that out. But can I encourage you this morning that this is you are you are solemnly impressive. Oh. 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 God has made you to. 
by purpose to reveal his forgiving attributes to a world that knows they need forgiveness. The new resurrection. How do you know the world knows that? Because you know you know that. You know, if you think about it, you need saving from yourself. And praise God, Jesus rode on that donkey and did what he did a week later because of his holiness. So we are holy ones by definition. It is our identity, what we are known by God as. God has a name for us. He calls us saints. Just you cherished you cherished impressive individuals. You cherished impressive, awesome individuals. Come on, let's get let's let God just do some do some healing of our minds because I know that you hear a bunch of other stuff that does not agree with that. And most of that other stuff comes from So God is saying, you are absolutely impressive. Holiness is primarily not about behavior, but about awe, about uniqueness, about identity, about being set apart by God as a special treasure. Now, expect less and appreciate more. Imagine we set each other apart. We, we get it. We get it. We get it about each other. We get it. You are, you are, you are holy, absolutely, uniquely, solid, impressive. And therefore, you are absolutely in the mood for some forgiveness. You are completely and absolutely in the mood for some mercy because you know that God knows that you need it and God has picked me to do it. Expect less and appreciate more. You just all nodded before when you said, I love that kind of relationship. So imagine if you felt that you prospered in that space, how the one next to you would also prosper in that space. Did you know from creation, God is different to humanity? Did you know that he is different to heavenly hosts and angels? This is absolutely an idea. There's nothing like him. There's so when angels are singing holy, they're looking at one another and going, well, you're pretty impressive. Look at the wings you have. But let me tell you something. You don't deserve a holy cry right now because... Ah! God is completely and absolutely unified himself. And I'm going, on a, um, I'm going on a mission this year to add some words to the dictionary. If you, if you have heard every year, at the end of the year, you know they have the good word. And some of them are just a time. So I'm going to do it as well. Because the world's doing it. Now I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on social media. So I don't have a platform. <laughs> Except for about 121 chairs. <coughs> Did you know there's another word I created this week? What was it? Give me a 20. Help me. Believe in action. Yes. It's the combination of what you imagine and what you believe for. It's your believation. That is better than giving good whatever the other one says. I think, anyway. How's your believation going? Do you know that God gave you imagination? And that imagination is fueled for his good by your belief. unchangeable, he is unequal, and he is untouchable. He is the God of the universe. He is, he, he, he's got a palm that holds some things. And you are disappearing. Now our God who is holy defines us as holy. Can we get this this morning? This morning, not because we have achieved holy by Colossians 3.12 example, but because of Christ's forgiveness Verse 13. Let's turn to Colossians 3. Go back to where we've been hanging out a little bit this morning. And look at verse 13.
Last week I mentioned that the utensils in the temple were called holy for a few reasons, and it's not because they were never sinning. It's not because those bowls and those utensils had never committed to sin. It was because they were set apart for a holy purpose. They were unique. There were some design features in those little things, those little babies that God went out. That is not fit for the home. It's only fit for the temple. Right? So they were holy because of purpose and because they were awesome and distinct from other things. They were exclusively used in the temple. You are holy and God wants to exclusively use you for forgiveness. Amen? You say you're part for it, you're consecrated for it. To be one is forgiving. So, how do we know? Well, let's have a look at verse 13 of Colossians 3. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Now, verse 12, remember, as the elect of God, so you've been picked out, chosen, you're holy, and you're awesome, and you have met your purpose, because you're followers of Jesus Christ, so therefore you, you're just amazing, and you're on purpose. And this is the outcome. Look at the outcome. There's the outcome. There's things we can be. There's things we can be. We can be tender. We can be kind. We can be humble, meek, long-suffering. We can be one another. Bless God. Who's had enough of one another? Ah, be careful, careful. Do <laughs> that. Just think it. Just think it. Just think it. Right, don't raise it again. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, who's got a complaint this morning? Remember, you had it just in your mind. <laughs> Come on now. I know some of you left the house going, oh. You did. I know you did. I know you did. And some of us left the house, okay, but then by the time we got to the first intersection, someone else gave us something to complain about. Didn't we? Right, so, so here we are, we're not complaining against one another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. So it's not an option. So it's not about, I've got it all worked out, and now this is, I'm going to really, really try, really, really, really. Today, I'm going to give it my best effort. I'm going to really, really, really not complain. See, it's not about that. It, it, it's about knowing who I am, that complaint is not a part of this nature. And so when this, this the old man, remember we talked about it a few weeks ago, we mortified ourselves, we, we maybe some of us are pretty good at epidermic, and we've, we've bought our dead self, looking like our life self, but can I tell you that your dead self needs to stay dead. Your old nature, right? You put, you put him off, he's, he's finished. So that Christ's life appears. So there's, there's a must do in forgiveness. There's a must do in me because Christ must do it. Because Christ must be forgiven because he was set apart and consecrated as the one who would forgive sin. So he must do it. He must do it. And when he wrote in that don and on that donkey and he set that whole week up and, and then he went through his crucifix, he said, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna rise again because I must forgive your sin. Ah, it's I'm set apart, it's my space. I'm the son of God. I am him, and I am going to do me. Right? So, so here Jesus is going, this is Christ the gave Paul's going, you say you must do. Jesus is doing him and you're revealing him, so guess what we do? We just do what we do. We do forgiveness. And you say, hang on a second. Don't just tell me to do that. Well, I did it. Someone else did. And he's the one that did it for you. Set apart as forgiveness for the whole purpose, you are awesome and forgiving. Come on. You are. You, you, because of purpose and awesomeness colliding, forgiveness, it's done. Amen? 
Yeah, amen. Amen. Let's continue. I'm gonna we're gonna talk more about forgiveness because I know it's not just that simple as a amen. But it starts with an amen. It starts with a care. I know I've got this thing happening in this relationship or this past hurt, and, and it is it has defined me. But can I tell you this morning that there is a new definition for you? It is as Christ forgave you, so you forgive. You are defined as a forgiver. Because the one who set himself apart to be it and to do it has done it. And we are one with him. So without doubt, God's tender mercies were active on a day that we're going to read in Acts 7. Turn with me to Acts 7. We played around a little bit here last week and the week before. And we might play around here a little bit longer because this is such a powerful example of a young man just like you, full of the Holy Ghost, finding himself in a horrible situation and doing what he must do. I reckon, I reckon that this young man, Stephen, he hadn't heard from Paul yet, any of Paul's messages, because he only heard from Saul of Tarsus. And you and I both know that Saul of Tarsus was not a very nice gentleman. Now Saul was Paul. Paul was his Greek name. Saul was his Hebrew name. He was known in that space. Now, let's have a look at what we, what we find here in, in 7 verse 55. And, but he being full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven... Important that we see Jesus high and lifted up. Believe that Jesus believes that it's important that we see him high and lifted up. So this morning, if you are visionary, um, we had uh, a vision this morning of Jesus walking, coming into our room as we were worshiping. You like share? Do you mind if I share your light? I don't know whether I'll get it right correctly if I get part of it wrong. But during pre-worship, worship. There's some things that happened here earlier than, than what you've walked in to see. Um, the worship team were just on their knees before God and, and Eli had this amazing experience where he saw that Jesus was amongst us come in on his donkey and we were laying down hung from us and clothes and he was in our midst. And there's more to it. Maybe Eli would like to share it sometime. Now? It's on the time. Want to get your head around it? Sorry? That's pretty much right. And so during worship, I was thinking about, oh God, Jesus, what did you do? What was the purpose of you doing that that day all those years ago? Well, the purpose of doing it that day was it was a triumphant. It was a day he had come as the king. It's standards in scripture about how meetings took place. I've got a bunch of scriptures right here that I can go through with you, but I'm not going to because there's about, someone said, how many did you say, Clint? There was? 150 or so. I've got a document here that I've created that's a few pages long and it's called The Church, Where's Your Head At? We had a message preached a few weeks ago. And a whole bunch of stuff about what the church, the authority standard of the church from scripture, how they behave, what they acted like, what happened, where they did, what they are powerful. Because you know that on the first day of the week they met in synagogues in smaller congregations. Hallelujah. And do you know what was happening in those spaces while well, the Spirit of God was moving? There was worship happening. There was an edification, encouragement of the Word happening. So everything you see us doing as a church is taken from here as an authority standard where God says, I move that way. And so I believe that in our church, when we come and we meet on the first day of the week every Sunday, that God is going to reveal Himself to us. And I know that it's happening because there's been a couple of testimonies. There's been some people here that have been here in the last few weeks that have said, I saw Jesus. Remember, I started with Isaiah 
not saying so. That Isaiah saw Jesus. Now let's look at what happened when Stephen saw Jesus. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. You know, when we see Jesus standing in his place of authority, you know what it, you know what it recommends to us to think? Triumphant victory has taken place. So when Stephen saw Jesus in this position, he knew that our victory has been won. Jesus, he's, he's established himself and uh, he's not coming back yet. I might just go to him. Right? So let's pick it up in verse 56. And said, look. So Stephen says, look, I see heavens opened and the Son of Man. He's saying, when the fullness of the Holy Ghost is upon you, when you are full of the Holy Spirit, guess what you say to people? You don't say, look, you just hurt me. You don't say to them, look, you just picked up a stone and you have bad intentions for that stone. Come on now, that's not what we do. When we're full of the Holy Ghost, we go, look, heaven's open. Have a look at Jesus. Now, where, who's in the world? Where's, where, huh? How are they going to see Jesus? Well, we're going to go on, we're going to find out. So, Stephen is seeing Jesus and he's going, look everybody, son of man, ah, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And then they cried out with a loud voice, come on, dead. It says they stopped their ears. You're not listening to that again. Don't you dare tell me where Jesus is. I'm not coming to church because the last time I came to church, someone hurt me there. and those stones they picked up and they started pelting him with stones. And there was a young man named Saul. Uh, he's standing by and they're throwing some clothes at his feet. It's funny that that's what was happening on, 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 on uh, Palm Sunday. That's what was happening when Jesus came through on the donkey. There, there were people throwing clothes and he was right. Something significant about that. We might unleash that a little bit another time. But there were clothes being thrown at Saul's feet. You are the boss of this, Saul. You're overseeing this. Remember as Jesus came through, they were throwing things down, they were crying out, King, Hosanna. Recognition that there's someone here who's overseeing the matter. Potentially, let's look at that another time. Here we go. There's clothes being thrown at the feet of Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. We know that Stephen was able to call on that because of why. Why was Stephen able to say, Jesus, it's time for you to receive me? Love it. For the, for the sake of those around? Yep. Do you know there's something else that I believe was significant? How could Stephen say, without a doubt, Jesus, it's time, here I come? Because Jesus did everything he was set apart and consecrated to do. He followed his call. He forgave sin. We know this is true because he says, Receive up my spirit, and then he kneels down and he cries out with a loud voice in verse 16. And he says, Lord, 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 do not charge them. The boss as well, Saul, the one who's overseeing all this. Do not charge them with this sin. We know that he knew Jesus as a forgiver. Because he was able to say, here I come right now in the midst of this horrible circumstance. And I know you, Jesus, as a forgiver. I know you as one who does not charge sin to the culprit, to the one who committed the sin. But that you are one who charges him. 
And so though the people did not want to see Jesus, they saw him anyway. You see, I believe we have some loved ones, some friends, and some community members, people we work with, that we would love them to see Jesus. We, we're praying for them, we've been believing God for them, we're, we, we're just, oh God, it would just be amazing if they could just see Jesus. But all they seem to be saying is, stop it, you're annoying me, stop it. You square eyed Jesus freak. I had some friends at school that were like that. I wore glasses in school and I was a Jesus freak. Most of people, they just, they weren't very nice. So here's Stephen, he's got some people that are not being very nice to him, and he is operating in grace where he is revealing Jesus to people who didn't want to see him as a forgiver. And I wonder what impact that had on Saul's life. You are holy. Awesome and on purpose, and God will be glorified. Stephen called out Saul's awesomeness. He called out Saul's uniqueness. That he was made in God's image, and that he did not need to be the bearer of his own sin. And so when we operate in forgiveness, we call out someone's identity. We call out someone's uniqueness. We call out someone's awesomeness as God sees them. We call out the purpose if they're not saved. We call out the purpose that, that in a moment they could not be the bearer of their own sin. And here I am going to offer forgiveness. I'm going to let them see. Arrived here today, I saw a couple of people arrive. None of us arrived in a toaster. 
there are people connected to the people that we forgive. And also, don't know it yet, they stop in their ears, they need to see Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning that you are the forgiver of the penalty that we deserve that comes from our sin. And this morning, maybe there are ones or twos or threes or fours of us here, Lord God, that have never personally experienced that forgiveness, that we have not specifically asked or identified or we have not believed in you. And so this morning, we just say to you, Jesus, we believe that you were appointed to forgive our sin. We believe that you were the Son of God, that you are the Son of God, that you came, you walked an awesome life on earth, you were holy, you were on purpose, and you did everything that you were asked, required, and desired to do, and that you are now seated at the right hand of God as authority over all. And you, if we call on you, you promise, if we declare, if we believe, if we ask forgiveness, if we by faith believe everything that you've done, and this morning if that's someone here that just goes, I believe in Jesus, please forgive me. I thank you for the forgiveness of my sin. And so right now, Lord, I thank you in that moment we are being born again to live the kind of life and reveal you, Jesus, not just be with you in heaven, but be with you on earth and have you here as someone we see and someone we know walking with us every moment of our life. I thank you this morning for that, for anyone here, Lord God, who's called on you. And Lord, I thank you that you have consecrated us, you have set us apart, you've given us your spirit to fill us to the full so that we can have the power to do the must-do's must do's of the new person that we are. And so we say this morning, thank you Jesus that I am awesome. Thank you Jesus that I am solemnly impressive. Thank you Jesus that I am uniquely full of awe and power and that I am now on purpose because of your salvation. I am born again and awesomeness has meant purpose. And I thank you, Lord God, that there is going to be some saintly moves that come from this saint because of who I am. That there's going to be forgiveness that flows from my life. God, there's going to be the setting apart. There's going to be the recognition of someone else's solemn, impressive state before you, Lord God. And that they need to see you even though they won't come. And I thank you, Father God, that forgiving ones are going to reveal the forgiving one, Jesus Christ. And I thank you for Stephen's example, for his testimony, that he loved being forgiven. He loved it so much that he, he said it upon his relationship with you and his relationship with others, that in that moment of horror in his own life, he loved you so much. He loved his forgiveness so much that he loved others the same. That he loved others as he was himself loved. Love one another as I have loved you. Stephen went out of that by the power of the Holy Ghost. And so this morning, Lord God, I thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost on every single one of us here to infiltrate our city with forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Thank you.